Well, we've been in a, this third week in a series looking at how family and home are, are themes in the Bible and looking at it a little differently than what you normally will. Um, the first week we looked at father and found out that, you know, the father theme in the Bible, that God is daddy, that God is papa to us. And then last week we, we looked at how God used a mother, um, Hannah, to really change the course of history. And just just looking at how God uses the theme of father and mother, today sister and brother, to, to work in the world and, and how he's like that. And, of course, to start off the first week, I showed that video on Welcome Home. I thought about showing it a couple more times, but um, it's kind of a hard video to watch because it what it gives us is this ideal of who God is. And it, remember in that video, those of you that were here, it showed people coming home, and most of them were in their 20s, and, and the parents were welcoming them. And, and sometimes, you know, especially in your 20s, <laughs> home's kind of a rough place to go sometimes. You kind of go up Fool's Hill, you know, and, and it's, it's not the best place to go. And, uh, but, but the whole theme of that was that God is with open arms, and, and God wants to welcome us home in the same way that that going home to a place where you're not judged and you're welcomed and you're supported, that's the home of God. And and so we, we looked at that, and it's emotional. And we, we learned that the families in the Bible are like our families. They're not perfect. The families in the Bible are, are all slightly, if not greatly, dysfunctional in, in lesser degrees, kind of like ours. But, but God wants us in his family, and that family's perfect. His, his family is ideal. So today we're talking about siblings, brothers and sisters. And I mean, let, I think we just need to own this right off because I, I've never known someone who for all of their life had a perfect relationship with brothers and sisters. I mean, it just doesn't happen. Okay, there's always some stuff that's going on with brothers and sisters. If you have brother or sister, there's gonna, there is now, or had been, or will be some rivalry at some time. There's gonna be some conflict. I mean, things just aren't perfect there, you know, always. And, and so what I thought I'd do is just show some pics of some normal families here. Um, there we go. That's, uh, it's, it's very, have you ever seen these pictures called awkward family pictures? Um, None of these are, uh, are us, but uh, we bought a book three or four years ago. Now they're all over the Internet. And so uh, stacking seems to be kind of a theme. I think that, see, if you <laughs> don't do this, all right, when you take your family pictures, because uh, you've got to look at them later on. And, and then lining everybody up is always a good thing with the same pose, hand in the back pocket. I didn't, you know, these are the mild ones. Uh, there's some really rough ones on there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Look at the day. The dad's going yuck. <laughs> he made, she made me a shirt too, but she got to appreciate it. This family, I just don't get. I mean, they're kind of dressed up like uh, Hawaiian tribesmen or something. And the guy in the middle, I don't know if he's a Civil War general or, you know, it seemed like a good idea. I mean, e e evidently they get this and. Uh, this family is really creepy. Uh, yeah, the, the the dummy in the middle, I think they think he's their brother or something. And, and just, you know, the hair. Oh, evidently mom's not the nicest person in the family. Okay. Say, we could have used this last week, right? But eh, that would have been bad on Mother's Day. This last one. Uh, is is really the creepiest. Now, this is hard to get past. It's, it's really hard to get over. So so when you look at your own family pictures, just just think how blessed you are that your parents didn't do that or that isn't your sibling. You know, wow. <clears throat> My sister just left town and she was with us for a week and. Uh, uh, I, I love my sister, and, my, and she loves me, and we get along great. You know, we we really do. We didn't always get along great. There were some years in the 20s where it, it was pretty rough, you know. But we kind of learned that through some of our problems that we were we were there for each other. And and we, we've never said, don't call me, all right? There, there were times when we didn't talk for six months, but 
if we needed something, she was there. But we've got this joke in, in our family. It's, it's, it's really kind of painful for me if I would be that sensitive of a person. But, but the joke is, my, my sister and I are both adopted. And the joke is, is that uh, when she was five years old, that the parents, my mom and dad, decided to get another child because Denna needed someone to play with. I stop and think about that for a while. I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, a doll. And, <laughs> and uh, we say that even as parents, you know. Well, we wanted to have two or three children, so our first one wasn't alone. But, but th- we always carry this joke on and on, my, my sister and I, that, you know, I was just kind of the dispensable one. And, and they would go away on vacation and leave me with an aunt constantly. You know, why take the doll with you? She can find somebody else to play with. It was kind of, you know, we joke around about that all the time. But uh, we're both very secure with our parents and our birth order and all that stuff now. Um, But we admit that. But when you're talking about siblings, all the ingredients are here. Uh, We we know each other better than probably anybody else besides a spouse. You know your sibling really well. There are secrets that siblings have with each other that should never be shared with anyone, right? Right? There's some stuff that you just agree you're never going to talk about. And if you say that, I've got something on you. So you've kind of got this standoff. The other thing is is that we're raised by imperfect parents. And uh, we may have good parents, but imperfect parents knowingly or unknowingly always have a favorite at times. Maybe it's a seasonal favorite. Maybe it's for, for just a day or a week. But they play favorites at times, and that's just, it's just what happens. And then the other thing it's in here is we're, we're very insecure people, and we're always wondering, am, am I loved enough? You know, if she gets loved, does that mean there's enough for me? And, and the other thing is, is that we have a long memory on some things. We could have a sibling that goes, I mean, de, is really dependable, and there for us at all the games and all the, all, all the major things in life. But that sibling can say one thing, and we'll remember that one thing forever and forget all that other junk. Because we got long memories on things that are done bad to us, and oftentimes really short memories, and we kind of discount, you know, the good things. So our Western culture, largely due to the influence of Freud, I think, emphasizes the conflict and competition of brothers and sisters. And if you have a brother or sister, it's just assumed that you're going to have a grudge in our culture. We just assume that brothers and sisters are not going to get along. And, of course, Freud stressed that you never get the love that you need, and the brother or sister, well, they were just somebody else to take the, the love that could have gone to you, and, and that's just kind of our culture. I want to give us a scripture here to start off that's much more positive than that. Psalm 133.1 says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. You know, um, the word brother is most often used in the Bible for blood relatives, but sometimes it's used to be just a a, a reference to a clan member or a tribe or a nation. And remember that in the Bible, the family is the security system. And if your brothers or sisters are strong, that means the family is stronger. If they become weak, you become weak. And most of the instances in the Bible are pretty good instances, but the exceptions as when there's conflict, uh, are opportunities for real teaching moments. And the first one that we think of probably is, is you know, notorious Cain and Abel. And Cain was the uh, older one, and, and Abel was younger. And uh, God accepts the sacrificial offering of Abel, but for some reason does not accept Cain's, probably because Cain's kind of disrespecting God and not really giving his sacrifice, but just kind of leftover junk that he's got around the house to put in our vernacular. So Cain becomes jealous because Abel's is is accepted, and he thinks, well, the problem with my offering isn't my offering, but my problem is just that Abel's looks better. So if I get rid of Abel, my offering will be okay. So he kills Abel. And in the midst of that story, you know, it's a notorious story. Everybody's heard that. But in the midst of that story, we have that question that that Cain asked to God, am I my brother's keeper? And we learn through the story that, yes, you are. You are your brother's keeper. And nobody's really standing alone. Everybody has somebody that they depend on. And we are part of a, a community that we're supposed to take care of each other. And so that's out of that story. But the next story of sibling rivalry is one that I want to look at today. It's a story of Jacob and Esau. 
uh, twin sons of Isaac and Rebekah. And it begins there in Genesis 25, if, if you've got if you, one that follows along. And just to kind of keep track of people, I put a little family tree up here on the screen. Uh, the whole family tree is there in the bulletin. But if you haven't heard this story before, you can kind of get lost in the names and who's who. So this might help you if, if you haven't heard this before. But Isaac was the son of Abraham and Sarah. His wife was Rebekah. And she became pregnant with twins. Now, normally becoming pregnant of twins in their day was a huge thing because it meant God is really blessing you, especially if they're twin sons, because to, to bear a son meant that God's favor was upon you. To bear two sons at the same time means, wow, you are just overly blessed. But twins present this problem. Because one of them is going to be born earlier than the other one, at least by a minute probably. And the firstborn was the one that got the covenant rights. He was going to be the head of the family, the firstborn always. And the second son would be, you know, I'm a minute late, but I miss out on everything. So, so there's just this seedbed, this environment where there can really be some tension. But uh, God tells Rebecca while she's pregnant that he is going to elevate the younger son over the older son. And there's actually kind of a theme that runs through Scripture where God oftentimes chooses the second son, like Abel over Cain or you know, um, Jacob over Esau, or later on chooses David over all the sons of Jesse. And God doesn't follow the birth order thing. God chooses who God chooses. So anyway, he tells uh, Rebekah, that you know the, the younger son is going to to be the chosen one. But the problem is, is that Isaac, the father, in whose hands rest the giving of this blessing, I, Isaac is becomes literally blind, but he's a guy that's just kind of blind to what God is doing all the time anyway, kind of metaphorically blind. So it says that Isaac here in 25, 28, it says that Isaac favored Esau because he was a hunter, real man's man, you know, and, and that Isaac liked the taste of game, but Rebekah favored Jacob, who was a mild man, didn't hunt, stayed home with mom in the camp. You get the differences between these two twins? We got Esau, whose name means red, He's a big, hairy, red-haired guy. And Jacob, whose name means trickster, and he stays home with mom in the camp. And we know the story of how Jacob uh, tricked a bowl of beans out of Esau. You're probably aware of that. He's really hungry. Esau trades away his birthright for a bowl of beans. But, and the two men grow up, and there's even more conflict Rivalry got worse because um, Esau, at age 40, marries two foreign Hittite ladies, and that just wasn't done. And it, what that meant was he didn't like his family, so he marries someone beyond the family. And that was, it means he's, he's not a man of faith because he didn't marry in the faith. But Jacob doesn't marry. He waits. And when Isaac is old and blind, the time came to give his blessing, and so he sends um, Esau out to get some game, kind of for a last meal kind of thing. It's kind of strange because, you know, Isaac doesn't die for another about 40 years, but he must have been having a bad day, all right? So, so he sends him out to get some game. He's going to have a last meal, and while Esau is out looking for some food, Rebecca launches her plan because she knows that when he gets back that, that Isaac is going to lay his hands on Esau and give him the blessing as being the dominant family member, the head of the family. And, and so Re Rebecca, she uh, says, listen, I'll, I'll work this out, Isaac. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make some nice mutton stew and I'm going to take you know, you go in and get his clothes on so you'll smell like him. We're going to fake you being him, you know, Esau, while he's gone. And they put a sheepskin on his hand and on his neck. And so he, it works, you know. Isaac falls for it. You smell like him. You know, the food's good. Touch him. Oh, you, you, even, you feel like Esau. You're all hairy, you know. And Isaac gives him this blessing. 
Isaac says, you know, you're, you're become a father of many nations, which is the covenant blessing that comes from Abraham. But the only problem, Esau, you know, the, the manly man, the kind of duck dynasty dude, he's out there hunting and he comes back and when he finds out, he goes in, he takes his game that he's cooked in to get the blessing and Isaac goes, man, you're late. I already gave it away. Gave it to, gave it to your brother Jacob. Well, he's not too happy. Genesis 27, 41 says, now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Now that's sibling rivalry. Big time, right? Uh, he isn't, well, you, you got the big bedroom or, you know, uh, sh 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 you never had to take the trash out. Now, this is the kind of thing that ends families. So Jacob has to leave town. He has to leave the promised land and go someplace else. And his mom, who is from Haran and has a brother named Laban that still lives back there, it's 450 miles away, but she says, you got to go there. You got to leave town. So he goes to his uncle Laban. And, you know, as he goes there, he gets a wife. But there's another problem there. Uncle Laban, see, uh, is a trickster's trickster. Uncle Laban is sharper than Jacob is. And, you know, Rebecca, his sister, evidently had a little bit of Laban's trick in her. And so, um, you know, he falls in love with Rachel. He does. Jacob does. And he doesn't have any money to buy the wife, which is what they did in those days. So he works for him for seven years. And on the wedding night, you know how the story goes, on the wedding night, eh, a little bit too much vino, you know, uh, too many uh, toasts and stuff. He's a little bit inebriated probably. He wakes up in the morning and it's not, it's not Rachel that's in his bed. It's her older sister, Leah. He goes, hey, you know, what have you done to me? And, and Laban says, you think I was a fool? You think I was going to dishonor my older daughter by letting her younger daughter marry first? So he has to work another seven years. And, and after that, he's got two wives. And after living in Haran, you know, he's 450 miles from home. Jacob is so blessed. He's, he's got all these goats, all these sheep, all this cattle. And, and I mean, he's just... Every, everything that he does, his animals just are multiply like crazy. And he, he has, he gets so big and he, he has children, 11 children, and he has so many, uh, st so much stock and his tribe is getting so big that he and Laban start having some real conflicts. So he knows that he's got to leave. He's got to go back. He's got thousands of head of livestock and a large family, two wives, 11 sons, at least one daughter. And you can't just wonder about getting, without getting attacked. You don't just leave one area and say, I, th I think that looks nice. I'll go live over there. Because if you go to live over there, you're, you're going to have to fight for that space. So he's got to go home. There's only prob one problem. It's been 20 years since he's been gone. And 20 years since he's seen Esau. And the last time that he saw Esau, he was sharpening his sword. Okay, so what do you do? What do you say to a brother who gets less than you did? How do you mend a relationship with a man who just kind of grunts and says, I don't get mad, I get even? How do you go home when you, today, left in the middle of the night and stole your brother's car? How do you ever go back and see that guy again? What if you want to go home but you left home in a bad way. Is there grace you see at home? Is there grace there? Do brothers and sisters forgive or do they bear a grudge? And this scene, this next scene, is one of the most powerful and emotional scenes in the Bible. Jacob is a blessed man. He's super wealthy. He doesn't have a home. But his brother Esau, well, brother Esau, let's, let's be honest here, he's not the sharpest crayon in the box. Okay? And... First, he traded away his blessing, and then he married some women that he should, that didn't fit in the family, and they fought with mom and dad. And he has a temper, and he has a cause, and they haven't been in contact for 20 years. And you know, in 20 years, if you've had a conflict and not been with somebody, you get used to not having them in the family after 20 years. You've just ridden them off. 
So Jacob is worried, and he's real worried. Remember when he had, he had been the son who stayed home with mom while his brother and father went hunting, and we get the picture. Uh, he sends a mes- message to Esau, and the messenger tells him, he, the messenger says, hey, I'm coming from your brother Jacob, and he just wants to say, you're the man. And I'm the servant. That's what he's saying to you is you're the man, you're the boss, and I, I'm the servant. What can I do for you, brother? And I am rich. In these years, I, I become very rich. As a matter of fact, um, do you want some of this? Would, would you like some of what God has given me? And I have plenty. God's blessed me. I, I have all you that you need. And the messenger gives him that. Then he returns to Jacob and he says, well, we gave him your message. He didn't really say anything, but he's headed this way with 400 men. Oh, gee. This is not going to go well. Remember, Jacob was the guy who stayed home with mom. He's not the fighter dude. He's been home with mom. He cooks, all right? So he's a mess. He just knows Esau's on his way to kill him. So he says, well, they can't kill us all. You know, I'm pretty smart. I'll tell you what we'll do. Um, Leah, you take your group, all your, your kids and half the livestock, and you go stand over there. And then, you know, Rachel, you take, take yours. And he divides his camp, his family, into two groups, thinking, well, if he comes, he'll kill half of us, but he won't kill all of us. You know, that's his plan. That's a pretty, pretty desperate plan. You stop and think about it. And uh, there's no hope there. And, uh, you know... You sense that he's kind of at the end of his rope and he's probably his life. So in that state of mind, he has a prayer. And this is Genesis 32, 9 to 12. It's a wonderful moment in his life. And Jacob says to God, he says, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all your your deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two camps. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he may come and attack me, the mothers with all their children. But you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude." Well, first of all, this is all covenant kind of language is what he's doing. Uh, he does not call on God, but he calls on the God of Abraham and Isaac. All right. He's standing in the covenant, the covenant talk. And Jacob is who he is because of his father, you know, is who he is. And his grandfather. And he is not worthy. All right. He has not earned what he has received. All this has been a gift to him because of his father and his grandfather in the covenant. And he stands in that authority of the covenant that God made with Abraham and Isaac. And he reminds God that he would bless him, make him a nation as big as the sand and the sea. Let's, let's just suspend this story for just a minute and, and kind of think about what this means for us. Jacob's prayer is what softens Esau. It was Jacob's prayer right here. We have no other indication that any of the gifts, anything else worked. The only thing that we have here is Jacob's prayer. Jacob doesn't buy his way out of this. This is not about money. It's all God, and I firmly believe that if Jacob had not prayed and stepped into the identity and the place of this covenant into which he was born, Esau would have kept his vow to kill his brother, or at least he would have tried. You know, we say this all the time, but you need to remember it. Only God can change a heart. Only God can do that. Uh, If we have a conflict with someone, First of all, there's always a part of us in that conflict. It's never just them. We, we think it's just them. And they may have done something worse to us than what we did, but maybe we said something or didn't say something or, you know, forgot something. But we've always got a part in it. And we can try to make amends. We can promise things. But often what we try to do is not understood. It's misunderstood. And it doesn't happen. We try to make things get back together, and we just can't make somebody else reconcile with us because only God can change a heart. We can't do it. We can't talk them into it. We can't argue them into it. Can't force peace. Can't force unity. 
it comes from this inward desire of both parties. And I, I think that is God's area alone. After he had prayed and assembled, this, he, this extravagant, he, he assembles this extravagant gift for Esau. He, first he promises it, now he gets it together. And it says that he sends messengers ahead to meet his brother, and with them they take 220 goats, 220 sheep, 30 camels and their calves, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 30 donkeys, and they're all a gift to bribe Esau. Say, don't you want to be my brother again? Can I come home? This is just a taste of what I've got. The next day, we see he's really desperate. He looks up and he sees Esau. Listen to this. Genesis 13, 1 to 4. Jacob lifted up his eyes and he looked, and behold, Esau was coming and 400 men with him. So he divides the children uh, among Leah and Rachel and the two female servants. He had two servants by Rachel that had borne him children. And he, and he put the servants and their children out in the front. All right. And then Leah comes next and her children. And then Rachel and Joseph, his favorite son, uh, least of all. And then he goes out before them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Manly, manly Esau, tricked out of his place in the family, runs to Jacob, who by this time would have flinched had a child said boo to him. And Esau falls on his neck, and he hugs him, and you've got two grown men standing out there in the middle of everybody just blubbering all over brother. Isn't that a neat scene? You know, I'm so glad that God puts this stuff in the Bible. There's blood between them, but there's no blood that's shed. God acts through Esau and he extends grace to Jacob through Esau, the one that doesn't get everything. And Jacob deserves his brother's wrath but he doesn't receive it and it has nothing to do with the gifts. See, Esau says, what's all this stuff? He looks around, he goes, well, what's, what's all this stuff around? You know, what is this? And Jacob says, oh, I just want you to have it. Won't you please take some of this? And, and Esau says, I don't need this stuff. I just want my brother. That's all I want. Welcome home, brother. Isn't that a neat scene? And the good part of the story, huh, See, there's nothing I like about the Bible. It tells the good and the bad. The good part of the story stops right here. This is the best that this story gets. Because <laughs> Jacob, who's given God's grace through Esau, never will really make amends with him. He never trusts him. And you read on, and, and Jacob says, well, you go live over there and I'll live over here. And, and Esau says, no, come on, let's be together. And Jacob says, no, I don't want any of it, you see. And they only see each other one more time while they're alive, and that's when the father dies. When he dies, they get together for the funeral, and that's it. And there's no more mention that they're ever together, together at all. And it's not Esau, it's Jacob. He just can't receive God's grace. See, had he been able to pay for it, had he been able to, to buy him off with, with all of his wealth, he would have negotiated and said, that's cool, that's all right, um, we've made amends now, I've, I've paid for what I did. But you see, Esau won't have it because he represents the Lord here. He wants to give him his love, he wants to give him his grace, and he just can't receive it. Got my hair cut this week when I was at the barber's chair. A guy cuts my hair, really respect him. He's just a really neat guy. If he gave me a bad haircut, which some of you think he does, uh, I'd still go back and, and have Scott cut my hair. But I was in the barber chair, and he, and he says, how's your week been? I said, oh, man, we've, you know, my sister's in the house. And he said, oh, I know what that's like. My brother's been living with us since October. I said, boy, there's a story there. Your brother's living in your house since October. He said, yeah, he, he's... You know, he kind of, he needed somebody and he kind of, you know, he's got some problems and you know where this goes. And I said, man, that's, I don't know if I could do that. I like to think I could do that. But if my sister said, you know, my, my life has become unmanageable. Can I come live in your bedroom? <sighs> I don't know. You know, that's, that's a big step, isn't it? Right. 
knowing your brother, knowing your sister, right, to have them move back in with you. And so I, I said, uh, said to him, I said, man, I, I really commend you for that. Um, I'm sure it, it's not been easy. He says, oh, it's not easy. And I said, well, why do you do it? And he says, because we're blood. He's my brother. <laughs> How can I not do it? We're blood. I mean, what does that mean? It, it means that God's providence, I think, is at work if we will just accept it. Who the Lord has given us for brothers and sisters by blood is providential. It may be good, it may be bad right now, but they are given. It's not up to us. If they are weak, then we are to be strong for them. Understand? When we get weak, they fill in the gaps for us. But who they are is a part of God's grace and plan. And Esau was God's grace to his brother Jacob. And I wonder if we are ready to look at family as being an extension of God's providence and grace to us. All right? Think about it for a while. Are we ready to look at our family? That's, it may not be a good situation. They may be rough. But what role do we play in this? We might be the ones who are the Esau's that extend God's grace to them, you see. We might be the ones that God wants to use in this providentially. And by providentially, what I mean is that it's no accident and, and God is working out his plan through us. And sometimes we're the receivers and sometimes we're the givers. And we might say, him? I, wow, you don't know what he did. You, you, don't know what, you, you don't know what's going on here. Man, it's, it's been terrible what he's done. I, you don't know what she's like. Are you, are you in covenant with God? Do you know? Do we believe that God's covenant favor is for us? Are all the actions of our sisters and brothers stronger than God's favor? Can God's favor be stronger than what was done to us? Second thing here, uh, Esau is a picture of welcome home. You know, I just see this in the Bible now that I'm looking for it so much. You know, we, we do things in life and, and we get estranged from people. We get estranged from God. Sometimes we think it's just too much. I, I don't know if there's anybody in this room today that's ever been through that. Maybe you've come back. But we think it's just too much. What I did is an end to it, you see. And God is always extending his grace to us. God is always saying, there's nothing that you can do that will drive me away. You're always welcome. Won't you come home? Kind of like the father and the prodigal story. So maybe this is for you. Maybe not. Maybe this is, um, maybe this is for you where you say, I can go home. I can go home to God. Um, you don't need to do anything. It's all grace. That's what it is. Matter of fact, if, if you think you have to do something, you're just not getting it. You know? Because God doesn't charge us to come back. He doesn't say, you have to do all these things to make up for what you've done. Now, Jesus has done all that, and it was all enough. So you don't have to do that. He's just always looking for us. Maybe it's for someone else that you know. I don't know. If it is for someone else you know, then, then pass it on. Open up the word. Say, did you ever see the story of Jacob and Esau? I know you're having trouble with your sister or your brother. Did you ever see this story? Man, it's a great story about a brother that was wronged, and God worked through him. Next week, we're going to talk in the series, and we're going to actually talk about the household, how God uses extended families in the New Testament to spread his word, and he's still doing that today. Let's, let's close with a word of prayer.
in the waves of His mercy. As deep cries out.